Ah, individualism. An ideology that claims to be all about freedom, autonomy, liberty, and personal success. Doing what it is that you want without some overlord that you don't even respect telling you what to do. Self-reliance, rationality, equality, self-determination, the development of the individual and the examination of one's beliefs and biases with intent to seek the truth, holding oneself as an individual to an ethical standard, knowing yourself and what you want, pulling yourself up by the bootstraps and disregarding literally everyone else because all that matters is me! Who cares about others? It's all about me! Oh god, how the f*** did we get here? I often see individualism framed as something that's completely antithetical and contradictory to collectivism and vice versa. Individualism is typically defined as an ideology that prioritizes individual needs over collective needs, sometimes at the expense of the collective, and collectivism is defined as the exact opposite, where collective needs trump individual needs, sometimes at the expense of the individual. I mean, even the framing of the two ideologies in the simple English Wikipedia article paints collectivism and individualism as mutually exclusive and conflicting ethics. And usually when someone discusses individualism, they typically either say that it's bad and collectivism is good, or the reverse, collectivism is bad and individualism is good. But are collectivism and individualism really at odds with each other? Do you really need to choose between what's good for individuals versus what's good for the collective? Does choosing to prioritize one ideology mean necessarily repressing the other? And you have both at once. Is one better than the other? In this video, I'm going to try to answer all these questions, go over the origins of individualism as a concept, and argue that individualism and collectivism are both necessary and good, actually, and not mutually exclusive. And I'll discuss how the typical perspective of individualism means individual liberty and needs are more important than collective needs, or that collectivism means that Collective needs are more important than individual needs is a construct of our current material conditions and ideological upbringing rather than some sort of a priori truth about the nature of reality. We love talking about social constructs and the nature of reality on this channel, and that is what we will continue doing. Ideally, we could take the good parts of each philosophy and throw out the garbage, especially the garbage of individualism, because as I'll argue in this video, though some degree of individualism is good and even necessary, Individualism, in its current form, has many terrible contradictions that lead to terrible things, also as a result of our material conditions. 1. Where did individualism come from? Alexis de Tocqueville claimed to have coined the term individualism in the 1800s after going to the United States of America, which prompted him to write a book called Democracy in America, published in two volumes in 1835 and 1840. To him, selfishness meant doing things for oneself at the expense of the collective good, whereas individualism was a very typical American social attitude, emphasizing personal independence, self-reliance, and the pursuit of one's own interests. Though he liked the fact that American individualism fostered a sense of personal freedom, initiative, and innovation among Americans, he claimed that one of the potential dangers was that it would also foster isolation from others, lead to alienation and the erosion of social ties and communal bonds, and create the potential for the homogenization of culture and tyranny of the majority. Alexis de Tocqueville, however, did not frame this individualism as opposing collectivism. He recognized the value of individual freedom and autonomy and the importance of social cohesion for creating a society that's capable of addressing collective issues and promoting the common good. It's hard to say who was actually the first person to ever claim that individualism and collectivism are inherently at odds with one another, especially because prior to the 1800s, many philosophers discussed both collectivism and individualism as intertwined concepts. Like in Plato's time, philosophers talked about both the individual, and the collective in their works, and didn't really frame them as these opposing forces. Like, so much so that right-wing libertarians can't decide if Plato is one of them. He talks about the individual and having individual autonomy, therefore he must be an individualist like us. But he also talks about the collective and having a collectivist society for the upper classes, so maybe he's a totalitarian and a statist. But, but he also doesn't care about the poor that much, so like, what is he? They really can't figure it out. I mean, philosophy is debatable and whatever, but like, I would argue that no one was a right-wing libertarian in ancient Greece because the whole point of it is upholding capitalist property relations without a state. And capitalist property relations didn't exist back then. 
and neither did nation states. You can't really be like, we should get rid of the thing that doesn't exist yet. But whatever. As far as framing individualism and collectivism as having some sort of inherent tension between the two goes, there was one philosopher who you probably learned about in history class at some point, at least if you're in the US, who discussed this. In 1762, French political philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau published The Social Contract, in which he argued that to have true freedom and equality and other Enlightenment values, individuals need to give up some individual liberties to the collective will of the community, the general will, as he called it. But he wasn't like, you can only pick one, individualism or collectivism, choose wisely because one of them is really bad. His take was more like, societies are built upon a social contract to a collective authority, And though you need to give up a few individual freedoms for it, like you can't just go out and stab your enemies, you get nice things out of it, like mutual protection and social order and stability. So you're ultimately better off upholding the social contract and the common good. He also proposed that this process of figuring out what the general will is would require participatory democracy. During the French Revolution in 1879, Rousseau wrote in the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen that the law is the expression of the general will. All citizens have the right to contribute personally or through their representatives to its formation. It must be the same for all, whether it protects or punishes. All citizens being equal in its eyes are equally admissible to all public dignities, positions, and employments according to their capacities and without any other distinction than that of their virtues and their talents. I don't think that ideal really panned out after the French Revolution, though. But the spirit was there. They tried. I mean, they're French. They can't help it. I joke, I joke. Why do I keep making fun of the French? I literally took French in high school. But I also learned it from an Egyptian, so maybe that has something to do with it. Okay, moving on. Rousseau was at least the first Enlightenment philosopher to claim that you have to give up some individual liberties in favor of the general will. Which I guess is kind of true, because you shouldn't be allowed to do things that hurt people or the collective with zero consequences. But if your idea of having individual freedom means the freedom to hurt people, that sounds like a pretty big problem. But I guess white people really needed to be told that, particularly the French, especially given how gnarly their colonization of Africa was, which came after the Enlightenment and after the French Revolution. Uh, But apparently, liberté, fraternité, égalité doesn't apply to you unless you're French. That's why I make fun of the French. But anyway, given that the term individualism originated from de Tocqueville. De Tocqueville? 420 Blazer? But anyway, given that the term individualism originated from de Tocqueville in the 1800s when Rousseau wasn't even alive anymore, we know that Rousseau definitely didn't speak in terms of individualism versus collectivism. Two, the Industrial Revolution, its consequences, and Nietzsche. I've been blessed by Millie. In theory, an ideology that supports and prioritizes the liberties of the individual is great. Everyone deserves autonomy over their body, their life, their intellect, their values, their career path, and so on. But uh, how did we go from the Enlightenment ideals of progress, fraternity, equality, and liberty espoused by people like Rousseau to the modern pull yourself up by the bootstraps mentality? De Tocqueville predicted that American individualism would lead to isolation, alienation, and the erosion of social ties and communal bonds, and create a homogenized culture, but when did that actually come to pass? Also, clearly, collectivism and individualism were not always framed as two conflicting ethics. So, when did that start? I mean, it obviously had to be after individualism became a term, so at least in the mid-1800s. So we're going to talk about some philosophers from around that time, as well as the material conditions that inspired their work. The ideologues of any particular time period reflect and describe their material conditions. They don't create them. They also don't invent the ideologies and ideas they espouse out of thin air. Ideas don't just magically appear in a vacuum, but are a product of one's material conditions. So let's go over the material conditions of the time first. The first industrial revolution, lasting from around 1760 to 1840, marked a major shift from agrarian economies to industrial economies based on manufacturing and mechanized production. People went from making a living by tilling land or creating artisan crafts to now working in factories powered by steam engines and later electricity, leading to a specialization and division of labor. Technological advances in communication like the telegraph and in transportation like the steamship and railroads led to the expansion of trade, communication, and interconnectedness between different regions of the world. 
Philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche was born in 1844 in the German part of Prussia. The Industrial Revolution in Germany happened from around 1815 to 1835, so Nietzsche was born into a world where industrialization had occurred and global capitalism and colonialism already reigned supreme. Capitalism had shown itself to be a superior and more progressive system compared to feudalism, with its development of productive forces and erosion of feudal restrictions like serfdom and feudal land ownership. Instead of being beholden to the guy that owned the plot of land you had to till, individuals were now able to make transactions, accumulate wealth, and do whatever they wanted without some feudal lord telling them what to do. There was more stuff coming in from more places than ever before, so you could make even more transactions. Though Nietzsche also didn't explicitly talk in terms of individualism versus collectivism, he did discuss the difference between two moralities that he called master and slave morality, which is kind of similar, and Nietzsche inspired individualist theorists like the ideological garbage can that is Ayn Rand. So, According to Nietzsche, in what he called master morality, the basis of what is good or moral is defined by powerful and dominant individuals who create their own values based on their own self-interest and dominance over others. Basically, a morality that is defined by the ruling class. Meanwhile, what Nietzsche calls the slave morality is based on a reaction to the master morality, or ressentiment, as he calls it. Basically, according to Nietzsche, the working class thinks that the ruling class, with their master morality, are kind of douchebags and clearly the cause of all the working class's problems. So the working class rejects and devalues the ruling class's master morality in favor of their own morality that is based on that rejection. To Nietzsche, slave morality is pessimistic, cynical, and vilifies the ruling class. Rather than valuing dominance, power, doing whatever you want, it rejects the morality of the masters and instead values humility, compassion, meekness, obedience. What is good is defined by what is good for the community oppressed by the powers that be, not for the individual who's in power and doing the oppressing. In valuing all these qualities, the subservient working class can also claim that they adopted this morality willingly rather than having these qualities forced onto them by the ruling class. Nietzsche believed that we need to move towards a third morality rather than adhering to either of the two. Nietzsche had critiques of master morality, like that it could lead to a lack of empathy and the potential for cruelty, but he really hated slave morality, believing that it led to a herd mentality that suppresses individuality and what he called the will to power, which according to Nietzsche is a drive that all humans have to assert themselves, express their individuality, realize their potential, and seek dominance over others. He considered socialist thought to be an outgrowth of slave morality, probably because he thought having a class society was actually a good thing and maybe didn't actually want a secret third morality for every single individual. Alice Malone's article, Elizabeth's Nietzsche, discusses in great detail how Nietzsche's sister, Elizabeth Forster, who is often claimed to have inserted her supposed proto-Nazi ideology into Nietzsche's works after his death, actually did the opposite and took Nietzsche's at times eugenicist, anti-Semitic, and white supremacist rhetoric out of his works. But it's no surprise that his rhetoric was like that, given that his ideology necessitated the existence of a ruling class and a working class whose exploitation allows the ruling class to have leisure time. In the article, Malone pulls from Nietzsche's writing to showcase this. Nietzsche upheld the creation of art as the purpose of existence. Moreover, he believed that only those organisms that lived lives of leisure were capable of creating art. His worldview thus necessitates the existence of an enslaved class. Accordingly, we must accept this cruel-sounding truth that slavery is of the essence of culture, a truth, of course, which leaves no doubt as to the absolute value of existence. This truth is the vulture that gnaws at the liver of the Promethean promoter of culture. The misery of toiling men must still increase in order to make the production of the world of art possible to a small number of Olympian men. The Greek state, 1871. Was this perhaps a single isolated proposal? No, this theme repeats throughout his work. A higher culture can only originate when there are two distinct castes of society, that of the working class and that of the leisured class who are capable of true leisure, or, more strongly expressed, the caste of compulsory labor and the caste of free labor. The point of view of the division of happiness is not essential when it is a question of the production of a higher culture. 
In any case, however, the leisured caste is more susceptible to suffering and suffer more. Their pleasure in existence is less and their task is greater. Human, all too human, 1878. It's giving Elon Musk simp. Nietzsche was the original Elon Musk simp. He deserves his wealth because, like, he works, like, so hard. He does whatever he wants. He creates things. He's such an ubermensch, right? You're just complaining because you're jealous that he's so much better than you. Like, why don't you start your own company? I was actually really into Nietzsche as a kid, like, when I was 18, and I read his works in my ethics class. I was like, yeah, he's really on to something. And he did mention that we need to move past master and slave morality and create a secret third type of morality that values creativity and the affirmation of life. But given his belief that there must be a ruling leisured class and a toiling working class, he meant that the expression of one's individuality and will to power were only possible for the ruling class. Not every single individual would get access to this new morality that allows them to be truly themselves, be creative, and live life according to their own values. I think the reason Nietzsche's works have been so popularized historically is because despite his supposed desire for everyone to create art and live life how they want to, his ideology ultimately upholds the capitalist status quo and justifies having a ruling class that has access to leisure time just because they own the stuff required to perform labor, the means of production, while working class people have to sell their labor to the ruling class for a wage to stay alive. He was like, we need a secret third type of morality while maintaining the same exact relations of production. And stop complaining about capitalism, it makes you look weak. I suspect Nietzsche's master-slave morality dichotomy was also one of the earlier instances where collectivism and individualism were framed as being at odds with each other in the sense that what is good for the working class proletarian collective is not good for the ruling class bourgeois individual and vice versa. As we said earlier, ideologues don't just magically create ideas in a vacuum, but reflect the ideas of a given time based on the material conditions of that time. And given Nietzsche's material conditions of being born into a newly industrialized nation with a ruling owning class and a working class, he was likely just observing the moralities of the classes from his own petite bourgeois perspective. 3. Capitalism Ruined Individualism We're all products of our environment, which I have a whole video about, and Nietzsche was absolutely a product of his. He was also in a similar environment to Karl Marx, who was born only 26 years before him, and Friedrich Engels, my favorite Friedrich, who was born 24 years before Nietzsche. All of them were born in the German part of Prussia. Nietzsche wrote about what he observed and how he interpreted those observations, a morality of the ruling class and a morality of the working class. Marx and Engels, however, didn't just observe. They acknowledged the contradictions that were arising from capitalism, including the contradiction of class struggle, which was inherent to capitalism, and all the systems that led up to it, and gave us an aim to work towards, that of a classless, stateless, moneyless society. According to Marx, the philosophers have hitherto only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. Under capitalism, the ruling bourgeois class who owns the means of production wants to exploit and squeeze as much labor out of the working proletarian class as possible for as little money as possible to maximize profits, while the working class simply wants access to the individual liberties that capitalism, particularly economic liberalism, promised them. Marx and Engels never explicitly said, individualism bad, as far as I'm aware, but in the Communist Manifesto, they did critique the fact that the capitalist system replaced the previous feudal social relations with a system based on egotistical calculation, brutal exploitation, and callous cash payment. Marx also described the alienation that the capitalist system produced, alienating humans from the product of their labor, the labor process itself, other humans, and their own human essence and creative potential. According to Marx's sociologist, Dr. Eric Olin Wright, Capitalism produces competitive individualism, which arises from the fact that in a capitalist society, private companies constantly compete to attain the highest market share, be the best in the industry, and earn the most profits, which ultimately changes social relations for the worse. Because of this material reality, some particular social norms arise, like 
measuring one's self-worth through comparison with others and basing one's morality upon one's ability to be self-reliant. And because of that, solidarity and community are seen as important only within limited contexts, like within the context of a family unit, for example, but not an entire class or an entire country. Basically, capitalism creates competitive individualism and alienation and changes social relations for the worse. Because of the lack of solidarity and community for those not directly connected to us in some way, individualism in its current form does not mean supporting the individuation, creative drive, and self-actualization of every individual and believing everyone deserves leisure time to pursue those things. Put a pin in that because we will talk about that way more later. Instead, the individualism we have under capitalism is one that harms the collective because members of the bourgeois ruling class are allowed to do whatever they want without being held accountable, including pollute, exploit the working class, destroy the environment, even stage coups in some cases. Individualism as we know it today is terrible because our capitalist material conditions have created a particular type of individualism that prioritizes individual gain at the expense of the collective and disrupts solidarity and community. Capitalist competitive individualism only cares about the concept of the self and doesn't see beyond the self or recognize everyone else as individuals or even desire autonomy for every individual. It creates a world where instead of building community like social beings are supposed to do, we are actively becoming more and more alienated from ourselves and who we are as individuals and each other. Like, apparently there's a whole loneliness epidemic because capitalist alienation. Everything is bad because of capitalism. Nietzsche would call me a little weak with slave morality for saying that, and I would say the same about him too, so who cares? The word individualism could have meant a person who wants individuation for every individual and recognizes that everyone is having their own personal experience, rather than a person who thinks it's a dog-eat-dog, every-man-for-himself world and acts accordingly, or a person who thinks their experience is the default and the most important. But that's what we got in this world where the economic base taught us that particular set of competitive individualist values. Four, can individualism be good? I'm not against individualism in and of itself, but I'm against the form of individualism that is born out of capitalism, the competitive individualism that makes capitalists okay with exploiting the working class and keeps working class people from being in solidarity with other members of the working class. I'm also against the homogenization that occurs under capitalism via the glorification of consumerism and conformity. But I am for the idea of all individuals attaining individuation and self-actualization. I am for people knowing who they are as individuals, understanding their own special gifts and using those gifts to help the collective, which obviously includes nature, which we are part of. You're the weird animal that's living in your house. Even if that just means having a loving family or being a really great friend or organizing your community, growing a garden, stewarding the land, fixing things, making discoveries, finding out what doesn't work, leading the people, creating something beautiful, just basically whatever it is that makes you feel good and self-actualized. Imagine a society full of people who feel good and are self-actualized. That'd be way better than this mess we have now where capitalist cultural hegemony has taught us that it's okay to cause harm to others for our own benefit. What I imagine would be real individualism. Like, imagine if society was truly structured in a way that would benefit an individual, and if you, dear viewer, had access to all the things that benefit an individual and promote an individual's health and well-being. And I mean the entire unified whole that is an individual body and mind, which are a unified whole that expresses itself dialectically. Imagine if society was good for our literal physical bodies. Imagine you didn't have to stress about finances because you could take off as much time as you needed from your job. You were always guaranteed a job if you're able to work, and you had the ability to decide how your workplace runs democratically along with everyone else that works there. Imagine you knew that if you got sick, you'd have guaranteed free, high-quality healthcare, and again, with the guaranteed job thing, as much time off as you need to recover, which is something that is very, very good for an individual's well-being. If you get sick, it's good to recover before you go and do things, and it's good to have access to the appropriate treatment. 
and you only get one body, so you should really be treating it nicely. Imagine if you could study whatever subject you wanted in your ideal learning setting and have that education style be attuned to your learning style and free, of course. Imagine if you could walk to all your friends' houses and hang out as much as you wanted to without having to do a whole bunch of planning because everyone's busy and exhausted from work and lives far apart. You wouldn't be exhausted from work because you wouldn't work more than what you're physically capable of because this imaginary society is structured around promoting individual health and well-being, which would be inherently scientific also. And all of this would only be possible under socialism because democratically deciding how your workplace is run is the definition of socialism. But if all those things were guaranteed, what would you do with all your free time? Probably be creative, right? Like if society was structured around the well-being of individuals, you would feel supported enough to be okay being creative, which is something people enjoy doing and an inherently vulnerable act because you're like showing people your soul when you create things, which is why having to be creative in exchange for money often stifles creativity and makes it feel like a chore. And under capitalism, a lot of people just don't have the time or money or resources to be creative in the ways they want. Also, did you know that the Queen herself agrees with me? That's right, Irish playwright, poet, and author of the best fiction book ever, Oscar Wilde, wrote an essay called The Soul of Man Under Socialism, in which he discusses the potential of socialism to bring about a truer form of individualism, enabling a true expression of individual creativity unencumbered by the need to make something palatable in the hopes of earning critical acclaim or money from it. An individualism under which every single human being gets to effectively attain self-actualization, realize their gifts and their true potential, be who they were truly meant to be, and do whatever it is that they enjoy instead of wasting time accumulating commodities. With the abolition of private property, then, we shall have true, beautiful, healthy individualism. Nobody will waste his life in accumulating things and the symbols for things. One will live. To live is the rarest thing in the world. Most people exist, that is all. Oscar Wilde. I've seen that quote so many times, and it's never the full quote. Use the full quote, guys! It's about socialism, it's about abolition of private property! Come on! According to Wilde, art is the most intense mode of individualism that the world has known. I am inclined to say that this is the only real mode of individualism that the world has known. Wilde argues that the artist must never create anything for other people, but only create what he wants to create, and that it is only those who are not conditioned by others that can create real art and express their individuality. He also says that it'd be absurd to tell a philosopher or a scientist to come up with theories that didn't disturb people's sensibilities that were easy to sell, so why tell people what to do with their art? Wilde also states that for humans to realize their true potential for creativity, all labor that no one wants to do must be done by machines. It's kind of funny because, like Nietzsche, Wilde says that societies require slavery to run. But he also says that human slavery is wrong, so it needs to be machines that are enslaved. Oscar Wilde is just Nietzsche if he serves. <laughs> but that's a great idea, honestly. And at this point in time, we have the technology to do that or to at least start working towards creating a world like that. Too bad, under capitalism, the reverse is more profitable, so instead we get artificial intelligence that replaces artists, instead of AI that gives people more leisure time, so more people can be artists. And we have AI that commits war crimes, so no one has to feel like a war criminal. Which is yet another example of how capitalist competitive individualism is garbage and devalues people based on particular identities they hold, while denying the fact that every single individual is important and special and capable of doing great things if given the appropriate resources. This is a huge contradiction in competitive individualism. It's egoistic, it's selfish, it actually doesn't care about the well-being and autonomy of individuals. It cares only about the concept of the self and denies the experiences that other people have. It frames the self's experience as the default and the most important one. It treats individuals who are not the self as expendable. It's garbage. Five, self-actualization through community. True individualism that affirms everyone's individuality and promotes individual creativity for every single individual would be great. 
But the current form of individualism that we experience under capitalism doesn't actually value individuals, individuality, or individuation in any capacity. So of course a lot of us think of individualism as inherently opposed to collectivism when the competitive individualism we experience under capitalism is, in practice, quite harmful to and opposed to the collective. But treating individuals as expendable and exploitable is actually extremely contradictory to valuing individual autonomy and liberty and considering all human beings to be equal and worthy of respect. If you truly believed that everyone was special, capable, and worthy of respect, and that everyone had the potential to be great at something, you simply wouldn't exploit anyone because exploitation directly contradicts that individual affirming viewpoint. Exploitation of others is incompatible with treating every individual as if they're special and worthy of respect and self-actualization. True individualism, the kind Oscar Wilde wrote about, is not incompatible with collectivism. I'd argue you need both in a society to truly thrive. You need to think about how your actions impact the collective and consider the good of the collective and what you do. But you also need to think about who you are, what your needs are, what you bring to the world how you express yourself, and how your individuality helps the collective. And what you do to express your individuality and creativity in a positive, individual-affirming way is exactly what helps the collective. A model that demonstrates the intertwined nature of the needs of the individual and the collective is Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, which was inspired by American psychologist Abraham Maslow's experience living at the Blackfoot First Nations Reserve in the summer of 1938 for six weeks. Maslow stayed at Blackfoot Reserve with the intent to test the universality of his theory that dominance of some people over others maintains social hierarchies, but saw that in Blackfoot society, there was no striving towards dominance, but there was a high degree of cooperation, minimum inequality, restorative justice, full bellies, and high levels of life satisfaction. According to Maslow, 80 to 90 percent of the Blackfoot tribe had a quality of self-esteem that was only found in 5 to 10 percent of his own population. They weren't concerned about accumulating wealth and property, and wealth was defined by how much you gave away to others rather than how much you accumulated. Maslow was also shocked by how awful the white people living nearby were. He even wrote, The more I got to know the whites in the village, who were the worst bunch of creeps and bastards I'd ever run across in my life, the more it got paradoxical. He also noted that at the Blackfoot Reserve, self-actualization was the norm. This is likely because First Nations people might be more likely to believe that we are born self-actualized, thus treating others as being inherently wise and giving them space to express themselves rather than thinking of self-actualization as something to be attained. Also, isn't it kind of whack that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, something that probably every psychology student has learned about, was rooted in indigenous wisdom and ways of life, and that this fact was completely erased? Apparently the American and Canadian governments buried those roots because they didn't want there to be a positive narrative around the Blackfoot people. Yikes. White supremacy and capitalism are very intertwined. Maslow's hierarchy of needs is often presented as a pyramid of individual needs that must be fulfilled before one can attain self-actualization, which Maslow defined as the desire to become more and more what one is, to become everything that one is capable of becoming. However, the pyramid wasn't actually Maslow's invention and was actually first introduced by Charles McDermott in his 1960 article, How Money Motivates Men in Business Horizons. Also, needs like belonging and love literally can't be met without other people existing. So are they really individual needs? If anything, he might have envisioned his model as being circular, like this one created by indigenous scholar Dr. Cindy Blackstock, with the order of needs being subject to change and the needs themselves being intertwined. Though Maslow's model was based on indigenous wisdom, he did miss a few things in his theory, like the indigenous relationship to the land, which makes them more forgiving of the people they share that land with, and the fact that many indigenous people's actions are informed by the experiences of the previous seven generations and the consequences to the next seven generations. Dr. Cindy Blackstock created this model of the First Nations perspective that takes into account this community actualization and cultural perpetuity. And this model is honestly probably better than Maslow's, but Maslow's is a good starting point. Maslow likely would have agreed with these indigenous critiques of his work, given that in an unpublished 1966 essay, which he wrote 23 years after the publication of his paper on the hierarchy of needs, he wrote that self-actualization is not enough. 
personal salvation and what is good for the person alone cannot be really understood in isolation. The good of other people must be invoked as well as the good for oneself. It is quite clear that purely interpsychic individualist psychology without reference to other people and social conditions is not adequate. Six, conclusion. Other people exist, and so do you. Humans are social creatures. Thinking about an individual without the context of their community is useless, and thinking of a collective without thinking about the individuals that make up that collective is also useless. Individualism and collectivism are not mutually exclusive, and thinking of one without the other in a vacuum makes no sense. Capitalism makes us think of collectivism and individualism as opposing forces, which they are under capitalist competitive individualism that excuses the exploitation of certain individuals and makes people strive to be better than others at the expense of others. But a true individualism that supports everyone's self-actualization and self-expression would necessarily be good for the collective and for fostering a sense of community and belonging for everyone because everyone would know how they can contribute to the collective. Wouldn't that be great? If you don't know yourself, how are you gonna be able to contribute to the collective? If there is no collective to contribute to as an individual, then you as an individual who is part of a social species, well, you're gonna have a bad time because you're gonna be like, finally, I have all the time in the world to read. And then you'll break your glasses and be really upset because no one can fix them. And no new books will ever be published again. And you'll never talk to anyone ever again. Wow, that sucks. You cannot separate the individual from the collective as much as capitalism wants to and benefits from alienating us from each other. Now go out there and build community and organize because you, the individual, are part of the greater collective whole that you contribute to. And doing what is good for everyone's individual health and well-being is good for the collective and vice versa. Oh boy, another long video. I hope you liked it and learned something cool. And if you liked it, make sure you give it a like and subscribe to my channel for more videos like this one. And because we talked all about individualism, well, remember to take care of your meat suit. It's the only one you get, so be nice to yourself. See you in the next video. Bye!